So I said there are many references on subject. The subject that I discovered until now is well known. It appears in many places in the literature. I'll give references to the specific presentation that I gave, but this is not to claim that this is where it, was, it first appeared. So I started with a particle on S1. So I just write S1, and this is Appendix D. This was just copied from Appendix D of 1703-00501. And then I talked about the CPN minus one model, and that was taken from section 1.1 in the same paper. And then I talked about Charles Simon's theory, and there are many, many reviews on the subject. The presentation I took here copied things from 1602, 04, 2, 5, 1. I copied it right. And what I'll do today, at least at the beginning of the talk, a we copy discussion from here and from 1606, 01989. Okay, so I just copied stuff from there, but again, I emphasize these are not the original literature. This is not the original place where this thing first appeared. So yesterday we started with Chern Simon's theory and we discussed just U1, level K, and I would like to specialize today to some special cases which are particularly simple, which will be very helpful for us uh, later in the talks. So the first theory I'll be discussing can be called U1 level one. So we have a partition function, which is path integral over all possible gauge fields. And we have e to the minus i over four pi integral b db. And if you recall the discussion from yesterday, the level is odd, so there's only two. This is a spin theory, and it has two line operators, an identity operator, and another one, which is this transparent spin a half line, which are the identity, and this line with charge one. That's all there is. And the spins are zero for this and a half for that. And the correlation functions are completely trivial. So this theory, if we quantize it, just doing canonical quantization, space is some Riemann surface, and we're just doing canonical quantization, we'll find that such a theory, this theory has only one state in the Hilbert space. So the Hilbert space is very simple, it has only one state. Furthermore, the partition function of this theory on any closed three manifold is just a phase. Such theories are completely, almost completely trivial, the only information in these theories is in these lines which carry spin a half, which is very little information. Such theories have various names in the literature. They're called invertible topological field theories. Again, the definition is one state in the Hilbert space on any Riemann surface, and the partition function is a phase on every three manifold. A more down-to-earth way of thinking about it is that this theory does not really have any dynamics. The Hilbert space is one one state, whatever you compute will be rather trivial. And the partition function on every three manifold is a phase. So again, there is not going to be anything interesting that can happen as we vary the, the space and so forth. So the only thing that can happen is that this is this phase, and this theory is essentially a topological field theory. It's essentially, sorry, essentially a classical field theory. And the partition function Is that of just a gravitational Chern Simons theory? So, this is something I did not discuss in detail. This theory needs some regularization. And because of the regularization, there is some dependence on the metric. And the dependence of the metric in this theory is this gravitational Chern Simons term. And I'll soon define it in a lot of detail. I just want to say that the notation we'll be using is that the Lagrangian i over 4 pi bdb is dual to a classical theory with the action minus 2i, gravitational Chern Simons term. 
And the notation for this double arrow is not that this Lagrangian is equal to that Lagrangian. The equality between theories here is only under the, the functional integral. So you see here on the left-hand side, B is a dynamical field. We still need to integrate over this dynamical field. And on the right-hand side, this is a classical field theory. So the only thing I need to tell you is what is gravitational trans simons term. So we have a three manifold M, and the gravitational trans simons term is defined by an integral over a four manifold X, such that M is the boundary of X, of A is a pi, and in the math literature it's called A hat or A roof of R, and that's written is 1 over 192 pi, the integral over x of trace r wedge r. So this is analogous to the f wedge f that we have in four dimensions, and on the boundary we have a chern simons term. This is a chern simons term written in terms of the gravitational connection, and I hope I got the normalization straight. Now, we should ask ourselves whether this thing is normalized properly. For this to be normalized properly, we do the same thing we said yesterday. This is M, and say this is our X, a complicated X. M is the boundary of X, and you decided to choose an X prime. And we would like to make sure that we get the same answer. And the condition for that is if we take the same integrand and we integrate over this closed manifold, the answer is always 1. So that would guarantee that no matter what we do, no matter how we extend the fields, no matter which space we attach here, we always get the same answer. And the point is that on every closed manifold, I over 48, the integral of race R wedge R, and here I'll put 2 pi square. This is pi over 8 times sigma. Sigma is the signature of the manifold. And on an ordinary manifold, on an ordinary manifold, with, which is not which uh, is not necessarily spin, this sigma can be an arbitrary integer. So that tells us what multiplicative factor we have to put here. We need to put a multiplicative of 16 to make it well defined. Right? So that this would be 2 pi sigma. But if we have a spin structure and we limit ourselves to spin manifolds, then what I wrote here is meaningful. In fact, even with the, without the 2, it is well defined. So this theory is relatively trivial. I would like to modify it slightly. And imagine what I have is not the Lagrangian that I wrote down there, but I write i over 4 pi, bdb, and I couple it to a background field. So I add i over 2 pi, bda. Now the partition function is going to be a functional both of the metric through this gravitational trans simons term and a background field A. And recall our conventions that lowercase is a dynamical field that I'm going to integrate over, and uppercase is a classical field and that we are not going to integrate over. So the answer is going to be, the answer for the partition function will be a function of the metric in this A. And that's dual to what I will define now to be minus i, big I, is a function of the metric in A. Which is with this i, 
is 1 over 4 pi ABA. And I just want to make sure I have the right sign. Plus twice the gravitational turn Simon scale. And an easy way to an easy way to see that is just to complete the square here. If you just complete the square and you have a new variable, integration variable b prime, which is b plus a, so you will get something with a new variable and minus the one over four pi a d a. There is a minus sign here, and therefore we have a plus here. Okay, question. Okay, so we, the, 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 that's a good question. So the, the, we start with an M. This is our space time. And then depending on which theory we, stud, we study on M, the theory might or might not be a spin topological field theory. If it's a topo spin topological field theory, M should be, in this case it's oriented, therefore it's a spin manifold, but there's also a choice of spin structure. And the answer might depend on that spin structure. So that's what we have. Once we are in the spin world, there is a choice of spin structure, and then we extend it in four dimensions to a four-dimensional spin manifold, and the answer should be independent of the extension only for as long as these are all spin manifolds with a given spin structure that is compatible with the spin structure on the bound. Then we can go back and say, imagine, no, that's not what we are interested in. We are interested in a theory that does not depend on the choice of spin structure. That happens in U1 level K when K is even. In this case, we don't need to have a spin, choice of spin structure on M, nor do we have to have a choice of spin structure on X, and then there are more possible Xs, and therefore the restriction on the allowed terms is stronger, because I have to have independence of more, of more extensions. And therefore, this co the exponent has to be a larger exponent to make sure that it's independent of more options here. Now, I hope that answers your question. This is true, this is a mathematical, this is, you can view that as a definition of the signature. With all the pies and stuff. Right, so this is what we have, this equals to that, right? Because we have a pi square and a pi here that gives us the pi. And this gives us four times 48 is 192. So I can even write it like this. So the question is, what are the allowed powers that we have to put? We have to put an i, and then for a spin manifold, sigma will always be a multiple of 16, so e to the i sigma, e to the i churn Simons is, is normalized properly, but if we allow, we, we have non-spin manifolds, then there are more x's that we can put in, and then sigma has to be, can be an arbitrary integer, therefore we need to have a factor of 16. Was there another question here? Yes. Where does this uh, G in the capital I come from? Uh, what do you mean by G? The, the metric of the space. So this is a topological field theory. So superficially, it should not depend on the metric. But you need to regularize it. And through that, there is some dependence on the metric. We discussed it also yesterday when we said that the line looks like it's just a line, but it actually has some spin because it has some slight dependence on its called framing. And this R is given. Uh, R is what, I mean, R is R the, the Riemann tensor. So as a form, it is a It's a Riemann, it's a two form. And it also has two other indices which are contracted in the trace. And is it closed? It's, it's the same R, it satisfies the Bianchi identity, the same as R. It's the standard Riemann tensor. So this theory was almost trivial, U1 level one. It will play a role later. The only thing it does, if we take a theory and we just add it, first of all, it makes it such that it depends on the spin structure. That's the first thing. And correspondingly, it adds this spinner line, the Wilson line with charge one. And it also adds these classical terms, these gravitational churn Simons terms and so forth, and the ADA that we see here, that also comes out of this theory. 
But other than that, it's completely trivial. So we'll see, see that later today, that whenever we have this U1 level 1, we can always throw it away and replace it by some classical fields. The theory is essentially classical. The second example I want to study is slightly more interesting in the sense that it's completely trivial. So the theory that I'm going to study is i over 2 pi bdc. So we have a u1 times u1 theory. And we have 1 over 2 pi. So this does not even need the choice of spin structure. And this theory is completely trivial. It has no interesting observables, does not depend on the spin structure. The partition function is completely trivial. More generally, we can write i over 2 pi be the uppercase C, where the uppercase C is a classical field. Since this theory is completely trivial, we'll learn from that that this classical field C is constrained to be trivial. So let's see it in more detail. The equation of motion of B tells us that dc is zero. So there's no field, the field strength of C is zero. But the normalization here is such, and since B is a U1 gauge field, it could be non-trivial holonomies. We have to sum over them. And that tells us that the field C itself is completely trivial. Not only is dc zero, but the holonomies of C are also constrained to be zero, to, to be trivial, one. The holonomy is one. So this is the version in the context of chern simons theory of having a Lagrange multiplier. C could be any expression, classical, linear combinations of classical and quantum and so forth. We'll see that later today. We'll see expressions like that. And there would be a field B without a quadratic term, only B sitting here. And that would act as a Lagrange multiplier, setting the field here to zero. So here is an application of that. Imagine this big C is n times little c. This is a special case. Call it little a. E, another gauge, or e is a bad letter. H, another gauge field. So then the Lagrangian is i n over 2 pi b dh, where b and h a U1 gauge fields. So now let's use this recipe. B X is a Lagrange multiplier, and it tells us that the field NH is trivial. What does it mean that it's trivial? First of all, its field strength is zero. The field strength is zero. DH is zero. H itself is not necessarily trivial, only n times H is trivial. What does it mean? The field H could have holonomies around circles. So we have various cycles, not circles, we have various cycles in the manifold. So imagine we have a torus or something, so we have a cycle. And we ask, what do we know about the holonomy of H? Well, the holonomy of H we don't know, but the holonomy of n times H must be trivial. So e to the i, n times the holonomy of h must be 1. And that means that e to the i, the holonomy of h, could be e to the 2 pi i, an integer l over n. So what that means is that the field h is a Zn gauge field. This is a convenient way to describe a Zn gauge theory. If you don't like finite groups, its trick does not always work, but at least for Zn, we can use this trick. Instead of studying a Zn gauge theory, we can just say that what we have is a U1 times U1 gauge theory with this Lagrangian. And this is a trick that we will use often in these talks. I can barely hear you. 
n has to be an integer value, an integer value, and otherwise this whole thing doesn't make any sense. The condition was on this big C. I don't care what appears here. See, once I have such a Lagrangian, this C could be a classical field, a linear combination of classical and quantum field, but they're always linear combinations with integer coefficients. So this, this C is a linear combination with integer coefficients of whatever you want. And this B tells us that that linear combination is a trivial field. If that's correct. So if H is also dynamical, then both B and H are a ZN gauge field. And they, but they have non-trivial braiding between them. So the correlation functions of a Wilson line of B and the Wilson line of H, they have a non-trivial phase between them. That was a good question. Okay. I would like to move to the next topic, and that's integrating over fermions. Is this large enough? One of the comments I got after the talk yesterday that I don't write large enough. My, hand, my handwriting is terrible. I'm not going to improve that. And even if you put pressure, it's not going to get better. My elementary school teachers tried and they were not successful. I think it's too late now. But at least the size should be good. Is this readable from the talk? Good. So we, we should study partition function. What I mean by trivial is that its correlation functions are trivial. So there are no non-interesting, there are no interesting observables. There are no interesting correlation functions. It's exactly the opposite of what you heard in the previous talk. In the previous lecture today, you heard about theory which is not non-trivial. Right? There were interesting correlation functions. There was singularity. There was some stuff. This is completely trivial. It contains no information. But only if I put n. Only if I put n. The theory with one is nothing. So we would like to integrate out over fermions. And we have here the minus i integral psi bar d slash with some background field a psi. So this is one Dirac fermion. And we would like to do the path integral over that Dirac fermion. So this is a problem that we are trying to move away from topological field theory. Now we are moving to a, a in, more interesting field theory. So we had completely trivial topological field theory. Then we had this thing that was, oh, so this was completely trivial. This one was almost trivial because it was this, this dependence on the spin structure. Then we discuss U1 level K which is a non-trivial topological field theory, but still just a topological field theory. And now we're moving to a full-fledged field theory, a bit a Gaussian field theory. So it's called, the action is quadratic in the fermion, and we would like to integrate over the fermion. So what do we get? So first of all, we get an absolute value. So that's a determinant of d slash, which depends on a. So that's the easy part. When we integrate over fermions, we get the, the, the determinant. Do you know that, or should I explain it? Wow. Nobody wants an explanation, so I assume you know that. But there could be a phase. And the phase is a very interesting here. So let me first tell you the answer. It's minus i, i over 2, Something called eta, which I'll define in a second, which depends on the metric and the background field A. So I'm going to spend some time now discussing this phase. And this phase is interesting because naively this theory is invariant under time reversal. Like this, we reverse the orientation of space time, nothing changes here. But that would mean that the path integral should be real. 
this is the absolute value, but there is a phase here. So that phase has caused a lot of confusion over the years. The history of this phase is really interesting. Mathematicians got it completely right long ago. Then physicists were confused, and it was finally completely clarified in a paper that Witten wrote a few years ago, although there were some precursors of that decades earlier by Moore and his collaborators. That's come from the part, either you say from the measure or you just say that what do we mean by determinant? We need to diagonalize the Dirac operator. There are eigenvalues. We need to take the product over, over the eigenvalues, but the product over the eigenvalues is a, so the e to the, e to the, the, so the product over the eigenvalues, but that product is an infinite product. It needs to be regularized. In the course of regularizing it, the absolute value is what it is, but we have this business with the sign, with the phase. So, is there a sort of anomaly? Uh, there is a way of describing it as an anomaly. Now, I have to define eta, and let me first say what eta is, and then I'll spend a lot of time saying what eta is not. Uh, yes. Yeah, it, it, it depends on how you regularize, and I'll soon say exactly how it depends on the regularization. But where, where is the freedom in the answer? That, that's your question. And I'll soon tell you the freedom in the answer. So this is one particular choice. So this eta is 1 over pi times the integral of the thing we called i before, this linear combination of ADA and the gravitational trans simons term. So recall this is 1 over 4 pi ADA plus twice the gravitational trans simons term, where I spelled out with all its pi's and r before. And that's modulo 2z. So if we put all the factors here, what we have here in the exponent is i pi over 2, eta, and eta is this, mod 2 pi. So that we could try and write that. So it is as if, as if, as if, what we have in the exponent is i over 8 pi, ada, and let me ignore the gravitational term. But that's not an allowed term. Yes? Yes. No, but there's a coefficient here. That, and there's a co I'm, that's, a, that's exactly what I'm going to discuss now. So if you could wait five minutes, then maybe you, you can ask your question again. In fact, I'm going to focus on the dependence on A, because this, the main interest, so there would be business, yeah. So let me discuss the, the dependence on A, which is a much more a, to the point here, okay? So naively, the phase is this. There's a gravitational term. But that's not right. That's not right because, as I said before, that's not well defined. The thing which is well defined is 1 over 4 pi. In other words, so that's not right. In other words, e to the minus or plus i pi eta can be written using this definition as e to the, as is an allowed term. So. That's an allowed term. In the Lagrange, in the action. It's an integral, so i pi eta is there's a minus an i, and there's a pi from here, and eta has 1 over pi, so it's i over 4 pi, a d a, Plus the gravitational term. So that's an allowed term. 
So e to the i pi eta, we had as an answer e to the i pi eta, if we did not have these two here, we would say, oh, why are we talking about that? We should just write it as a churn simons term. And if we can write it as a churn simons term, why do we write it, keep it in the answer? We could have just redefined things by saying that it's without it. And that brings me to the question that was asked here before. This thing depends on how we regularize things. So you and I might decide to regularize the theory differently. Different regularizations of the same quantum field theory differ by choice of counter terms. So there are lots and lots of different regularizations, but pragmatically, instead of scanning all regularizations, we can just ask, what are allowed terms we can add to the Lagrangian? And in, here, in this case, these are terms that depend on A. So the freedom in the regularization is the freedom in adding allowed counter terms. So that's the freedom we have. So the freedom is in adding pi times eta, not pi over two times eta. So different regularizations will give the same thing, but the coefficient here will be pi times eta, which can also be written in more down-to-earth terms as a churn sinus term. But the correct answer has a two here in the denominator, and therefore, there's something intrinsic that cannot be removed. So there is a phase here. We can change the phase, but we cannot set it to zero. We have this pi over two, and we can change it to three pi over two, or minus five pi over two, but we cannot get rid of it. So there's a churn simons term, that's the ambiguity or there's a bare churn simons term. And, but in addition, there's this intrinsic thing, which can be thought of in, imprecisely as a fractional churn simons term, but that's not a fractional churn simons term. Had it been a fractional churn simons term, it would not have been well-defined. So this thing is a well-defined object, which is roughly half the churn simons term, but it's not quite a half, because the half churn simons term is not well-defined. No, because on the lattice, there will be a problem of fermion doubling, and you'll get two copies of it. And if you have two copies, the a half will become an integer, and then you will not be able to ask your question. There are more sophisticated ways of putting the fermions on the lattice, where there is no doubling. This problem comes back there. So this is a correct statement. It comes to, it, the non-triviality in this language comes about from the fact that there's an infinite number of modes. And since we have an infinite number of modes, we need to regularize it. And the regularization is going to break that time reversal symmetry. No, this computes at one loop. This is the one loop effect. If you just compute the one loop fermion, so, computed diagram. So imagine you computed this diagram. So there's a photon, this is the fermion, this is the photon. This will give you, and you just follow your nose and you do the computation with Pauli Villas or something. So that gives a term with two A's, the external legs. But that would give you eight pi A D A. And then you have to ask yourself, wait a minute, can't have eight pi. And that leads to this business. I mean, three dimensions. Every dimension is a different story. Not every dimension, there's some periodicity, but this is a subtlety in three dimensions. So that comes under the name of a parity anomaly. No, capital A is a U1 gauge field. Right, but that would make, time reversal symmetry would tell you that the configuration of the magnetic field and the time reversal would give you the same answer as with minus the magnetic field. Because of the anomaly, even that would not be true. So if you have a configuration with electric fields, naively you would say, ah, oh, that's time reversal invariant. 
the anomaly tells you that it's not. The magnetic field say, oh, it's not time reversal invariant, end of story. But you would say, well, it's not time reversal invariant, but instead, the answer for magnetic field B is the same as the magnetic field minus B. That's what time reversal would tell you. But even that would not be true because of the anomaly. That's common with anomalies. Yes? Well, I wrote explicitly what it does. It's this thing with I. I wrote everything. Everything is explicit here. So just as there's an anomaly, there's this ADA, there's a similar gravitational return simulstone on the right. Yes? Yeah. This G, this G is the metric that appears in the path interval. I'd like to make a few comments about that because this is a very confusing point. Imagine that we give the Fermi on a mass. And we integrate out the Fermi out. That gives us another contribution to the path integral, which would be another one of these I, 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 I over two eta, but the coefficient would be the sine of the mass m. So depending on the sine of the mass, we're going to get two answers, either zero or I pi eta, which we can write as I over four pi ADA plus the gravitation of turn sizes. That's good. Because once with fermion is massive and we integrate it out, since it's massive, the answer at low energy should be just a well-defined topological field theory. Or just a well-defined answer. So if the fermion is massless, we have this business with eta and the factor of a half, which makes it subtle. But if the fermion is massive, we have things that are properly normalized. So for negative mass, Imagine this is the mass, and this is m equals zero. Here the low energy theory is zero, and here the low energy theory is i over four pi ADA. And exactly at zero, it should be the average of them, so it tries to be i over eight pi ADA, which is not well defined, but instead we get this eta. This is the phase of the, I'm only talking about the phase here. So we see that as we change the mass from positive and negative, Changing the mass from positive to negative is a time reversal transformation. The answer is not the same. With positive mass and with negative mass, we don't get the same answer. I'll soon be more explicit about that. Now, I can come back to Fernando's question. Imagine I add another, I do the whole thing with another regularization. So what will I do? I will have to add a bare turn simon term. So a bare churn simon's term would say that here we don't have zero, but we have some bare churn simon's term over four pi ADA. And here we have plus one over four pi ADA. And in here we are going to have K bare over four pi ADA plus this pi over two Eta. So we can't get rid of the half. So the freedom in regularization allows us to bring the whole thing up and down. But no matter how we do it, we'll never get the same answer both on this side and on that side. The fact that on the two, in the two sides we get different answers is the statement of this anomaly. 
Another way to state it, and all these ways will be important soon, Imagine we want to apply time reversal transformation on our Lagrangian I psi bar D slash A psi. So naively we get the same thing back. But the anomaly tells us that there's a mistake, or not a mistake, there's a discrepancy, and that's this I of G and A. So this is common in anomalies. This is the naive answer, and this is the anomalous piece. The anomalous piece is well defined. The problem with anomalies is that we cannot get rid of it. We could have attempted to put half of it here and half of it here, but that's not an allowed term. So that's an allowed term. So we start from something well defined. We apply time reversal. We should better get something that is well defined. And we do get something which is well defined. But it's not what we started with. That's a statement that there is an anomaly. Then we could say, can we go back and change the problem by adding something here, such that we get the same thing on the left and on the right? For that, we need half of this. But half of this is not well defined. So we are not allowed to add it to the Lagrange. Now, the way this is usually described in the literature is different. The way this is usually stated in the literature is to say that the theory, the path integral of the fermion gives us u one chern simons theory with level a half. That's not well defined, and therefore we add a bare level a half by hand to fix it up. So in this whole discussion, it is as if this eta is replaced by a half chern simons number. And for many applications, that's good enough. This imprecision is good enough. But when you try to be really careful, especially in the applications that we'll be discussing today and tomorrow, and in many other applications, this leads to a lot of confusion, and it's really not a good idea to follow this route. So the historical way physicists have been thinking about it since the mid-80s was this thing that this is U1 level a half. So we will continue to use this, norm, this terminology. We would say that the theory that we have here is U1 level a half, and what we mean by a half is a choice of this bare term such that the level is the average between negative mass and positive mass. That's the level. So we label the theory by the average between this and that, which can be fractional. In fact, for one fermion, it has to be fractional. But we emphasize that this is not the result of the path integral, nor is it a bare term that we add. We are never, never going to add bare term with fractional coefficients. With one over four pi. Yeah. That's correct. Ah, because you're not, because the, this is not a time reversal, trans, this is not really time reversal transformation, because the Lagrangian is not time reversal invariant. Your theory is not time reversal invariant for two reasons. First, even for zero mass, it's not time reversal. And in addition, the mass term breaks time reversal explicitly. If we take only the time reversal violation due to the mass, that would take us from positive mass to negative mass. But that's not the whole story. There's also this a half that there's also this a half or that is intrinsic to the theory that we cannot get rid of. We have to take both into account. There are no anomaly for continuous global symmetries. Here we're talking about time reversal. More to the point, the anomaly I discuss here is a mixed anomaly between time reversal and the U1 symmetry. And there are several ways of fixing this anomaly. One is to say, to avoiding this anomaly. Imagine you have two fermions. So I have two fermions, then I don't have it, I get rid of these two, and then I can get rid of it by adding another term. Another way is to say that the fermion has charge two. 
If the fermion has charge two, then the coefficient here will be multiplied by four. Because it's a charge square, it's the same Feynman diagram that I drew there, it will be a factor of four. That's something I can remove. So there are various ways to have cousins of this theory that this issue does not arise, but in this theory, the issue does arise. Yes, the, the answer is yes, but I can actually, I, since you pulled me there, I'll give you the, the more co complete answer. This theory needs a spin structure because it has fermions. But there's something more sophisticated we could do, and we put this theory on what is called a spin C manifold. So it does not have a spin structure, and because only if we go to the four dimensional theory, it might not even be the four dimensional extension, it might not even be a spin manifold at all. We'll have non-trivial second, second state with Whitney class. But we can still place this theory there because then what we'll have to do is set that, say that A is not a U1 gauge field but a spin C connection. In condensed matter language, this is known as the spin charge relation. All the particles that carry spin have half integer spin, have all the electric charge, and all the particles of fields that have even electric charge must have integer spin. Then the two pieces in I, this and this, are not separately well defined, but their combination is. And then you will not be able to do what you said. This must have been a little bit more advanced. But the phase will be one over four pi, not one over eight pi. You're not going to get rid of this eight pi. What you can do is similar to what we did in the first lecture. See, if we could only add one over eight pi here, we would be in business. So, but we cannot do that because there is an alternative to that. So since you brought it up, in fact, I wanted to plan, I plan to say that and I forgot. So there's something else we could do and say that our Lagrangian is I psi bar d slash psi A, and this is integrated over some three manifold. And what we would like to do, and I might get the psi wrong, we would like to have that. That's not well defined. So we cannot do that to make it time reversal invariant. That would get rid of the phase. But we cannot do that. However, let's imagine that we have a four manifold, and M3 is the boundary of the four manifold. And then we write that on the four manifold. Now it's well defined, and it is time reversal invariant, but it depends on additional data. Have we seen something similar in these lectures before? There was a term that we wanted to add to fix things up, but it was improperly quantized. So either we say we don't add it and then the symmetry is not what we thought, or we add the bulk and we extend the fields to the bulk, and now we have all the symmetries, but the price we pay is the things depend on what happens in the bulk. Have we seen that before in these lectures? Where? But don't speak together because I cannot understand that. So the first example, when we had a particle on the circle, it was a symmetry O2, and when we coupled it to background fields, we could not preserve that symmetry. So we either said that the symmetry is not there, either the charge conjugation or the U1 is not quantized correctly and so forth, or we keep everything as it should have been, as we wanted it to be, and if the price we pay is that we add the bulk and we extend the fields to the bulk. And then what we did <clears throat> was to write F, so there was again half of what we were allowed to write, and we wrote it as an integral of f, which makes sense. The price we pay is that now the answers depend on what happens in the bulk. 
So that's another way of preserving the symmetry. And who knows what this is called in condensed matter physics? This is our M4. And 1 over 8 pi corresponds to theta equals pi. And that's theta equals 0. So we have a material that has theta equals pi here and theta equals 0 here. And now we have free fermions on the boundary. And the whole setup is time reversal invariant because everything is time reversal invariant. This is invariant, this is invariant, and the fermions are invariant, but this is not a three-dimensional field theory because it depends on additional data. It depends on what A does in the bulk. Sorry? Well, whatever A is classical, whatever lives in the bulk is always classical. Dynamical fields for me live in the boundary. Classical fields can live in the bulk. I'm doing terribly with time. Okay, I'll just continue. Uh, whatever rate we go and we might not cover everything I planned. And it would be, um, okay, we'll deal with that as we go along. I would like to change the topic a little bit. Sorry? Because it's not. But it has two indices. In plain English, this is the electric field times the magnetic field. This is E dot B. There are many ways of saying it. Okay, I'd like to change topic a little bit. So I'll write this statement and then I'll explain what I mean by that. And here I'll be in Euclidean signature. So from this point on, I'll change signature to be Euclidean. So I'll first write the statement and then I'll define what the various symbols mean and what the physics is. Okay, left-hand side. Phi is a sc complex scalar field. And in general, we start in the UV with the Lagrangian that has that kinetic term. And there's some R phi square, and there's some lambda phi to the fourth. That's what we have in the UV. And we flow to the infrared. And we have what is known as the Wilson-Fisher fixed point. It's a non-trivial conformal field theory that in the previous lecture you learned how to solve. More precisely, this is the O2 Wilson Fisher fixed point. This is one of the most important fixed points. It actually exists in nature. And as, as we do that, lambda becomes large and R becomes large. And R is a parameter that sits here. Here R is positive. Here R is negative. And in between, there's a value of r, which we can define to be r equals 0. Where there's a non-trivial fixed point. So I'll symbolically denote it without this term, with the coefficient r1 here, to denote the fact that we are already in the infrared, and there's no dependence on lambda. So what appears here on the left-hand side is shorthand notation for the theory at the fixed point, which we can later deform. This theory has a global U1 symmetry, hence the name O2 sigma model. It actually has an O2 symmetry, because there's also charge conjugation. And under that, that rotates phi by a phase. And as such, we can add here background field. And that's what we wrote here. So what we mean by the left-hand side is the Wilson-Fisher theory at the fixed point coupled to a background U1 gauge field, B, 
which couples to this global U1 symmetry. That's what we have on the left-hand side. What do we have on the right-hand side? We put hats to denote the fact that this is different than the left-hand side. If we did not have this B here, it would have, exact, would have been exactly the same. This is the Wilson-Fisher fixed point. And we could have put a background field here in the kinetic term, just as we did on the left. But now we say this is lowercase. Lowercase for us means that this is a dynamical field. So in the path integral, we put perhaps some kinetic term for B, for B hat, and we go all the way to the infrared. So we took the Wilson-Fisher fixed point, we coupled it to a dynamical U1 gauge field, V hat, and we go all the way to the infrared. That's what we do on the right-hand side. And if we have U1 gauge symmetry, we automatically have a global U1 symmetry here, whose current is the field strength. Let's call this a magnetic symmetry. So here, on the left-hand side, B couples to the current phi star phi bar B phi. And in here, B couples to dB, the dual of that, so another current. So these are a priori two different field theories. I defined both of them. One of them is the Wilson-Fisher fixed point coupled to a background field. And the other is the gauge version of the Wilson-Fisher fixed point. Again, coupled to a background field. And the non-trivial statement is that these two fixed points are actually the same. Here we see a difference between the spirit of these lectures and the spirit of the of Aldai's lectures. Here we start from a Lagrangian in the UV, which is weakly coupled, and it becomes more and more strongly coupled as we go to the infrared. And then in the infrared, we have a non-trivial fixed point. So we have two different starting points to describe the same non-trivial fixed point. In Aldai's lecture, there was no Lagrangian. He says, I don't care where this thing came from. It is somebody hands you a conformal field theory. Somebody hands you a fixed point. He is interested in computing the correlation function. Now, one might think, oh, we have two problems. One from the theory on the left, one for the theory on the right. But Alda is going to find the same answer for both. So the perspective is different. Either you start from two different Lagrangians in the UV and you end up with the same fixed points, the same fixed point, or you say, I don't have any Lagrangian, I'm just interested in these consistency conditions, and the answer is what it is. So this is called particle vortex duality, and in order to explain why it is called so, we need to analyze it a little bit. And I should have put it over 1 over 2 pi. There's, I missed an i here and a 1 over 2 pi here. Now I think everything is correct. So let's see whether this thing actually makes sense. So what is the cast of characters first? Before we start correlation functions and so forth, what will Aldi compute in this theory? Well, there's one natural object to compute correlation functions of. Can anybody suggest? What should we study in this theory? Correlation functions of what? Phi. Phi is a good object to study. So we can study correlation functions of phi. So on the left-hand side, we study correlation functions of phi. And phi is charged under the global U1 symmetry. Here is charge 1 under the global symmetry. What are the interesting things to study on the right? Phi hat. Who said phi hat? Any other suggestions? Phi hat is not a good thing to study, because it's not gauge invariant. So phi hat is not a good idea. So what should we study? What are the interesting local operators to study in this theory? DB. DB hat is a good one to study. That's the current. So we've already discussed phi bar. 
That's a good object to study. But is there anything else? And here I left out the hat. Sorry? Fast type five is a good study, the thing to study. We'll soon study it. But there's one more object. Well, what are the charged objects? Is, so there's a global U1 symmetry here, couples to the background B. Is there an operator that carries charge under that symmetry? I'll give you a hint. It figured in my talk yesterday. Monopole operator. Very good. Who said that? Good. You get extra credit. So the statement of the duality is that phi from the left-hand side is mapped under the duality to a monopole operator. We call a monopole operator is defined by removing this point from space-time and specifying boundary condition of B hat around that point. That's very surprising. Phi is an elementary field on the left, and it looks this horribly complicated object on the right. But this is one of the hallmarks of duality, that simple things on one side become, are complicated on the other side. And if you heard my talk on Monday, I said that more than once there, and I'll say it again here. So this is the monopole operator, B hat. We can also try to map phi square, and I'm soon going to argue that that's mapped to minus phi hat square. This is something else that people ask about. So there has to be a complete dictionary between the operators on the left and the operators on the right. Otherwise, the duality would not be true. So let's give more evidence that this picture is right. And let's take this fixed point and restore this parameter r. So we can make R positive by going this way, or making R negative going that way. So let's examine what happens to the theory on the left as we turn on this R. So on the left, if R is positive, and phi is massive, The theory is gapped, and there's an unbroken U1. It couples to B. What happens if R is negative? So what happens if I add minus phi square here? Can somebody tell me? Sorry? That's right, Mexican hat, and then what? Spontaneous symmetry breaking. So there's a global U1 symmetry, and spontaneously broken, the symmetry is spontaneously broken, and what do we find at long distances? Goldstone mode. Which I'll denote by curly phi, which is the phase of phi. There's a prefactor that we don't care about. So let me write phi, phi absolute value, e to the i, this is val phi. This is the Goldstone mode. So the theory is not, is it gapped or not? It's gapless. So the theory is gapless, and there's a Goldstone mode. Let's reproduce these answers on the right-hand side. I just, okay, yes? You cannot read. Thank you for pointing it out. This is Goldstone. This is T. This is Goldstone. This is the name of a person. This is Va Phi. And the Goldstone mode is the phase of Phi. What appears on the right hand side? So I claim that R positive. The map between the operators is there is a minus sign. So on the right hand side, R positive means that there is a negative phi hat square. So again, there is a Mexican hat potential. And what does it do on the right hand side? There is a Mexican hat potential. 
Higgs. So the system is gapped. But it's gapped in a different way. On the left hand side, it's gapped in kind of a trivial way. And on the left hand side, it's gapped using the Higgs mechanism. What are the particles in this Higgs space? Sorry? Well, the, it's all massive, so B hat is it, B hat is three, and then it eats the modes, and it becomes massive. It doesn't protect it. It's not protected by any quantum numbers, so it's complicated. But there's something that is protected by quantum numbers which is massive in this phase. There are vortices. So this is where the expectation value of phi hat rotates around. So the spectrum has particles, which are vortices. And the integral of db hat of a space is non-zero. Therefore, the vortices carry a quantum number. They carry a quantum number of this current. They carry a quantum number of this current means that they couple to B. So the spectrum includes particles. So these are particles. Massive particles charged under U1B, exactly as on this side. So on the left-hand side, for R positive, we have these phi particles. These are the elementary field, the elementary particles. There are the particles in the spectrum, and they are massive, and they carry charge. On the right-hand side, the symmetry is Higgs. Totally different physics, they are vortices, and the vortices are particles, particle-like excitations, and they carry charge under this U1B. So if all we know is that they are particles and they carry charge under the only global U1 symmetry in the problem, then the two sides look the same. The words and the derivation and all that are different than the two sides. What happens when R is negative on the left-hand side? So our negative here was Mexican hat. That means that here, the phi hat square is with a positive side. So phi hat gets a mass. So phi hat is massive. So is the spectrum gapped or not gapped? Are there any massless modes? The gauge field remains. So we have a gauge field in two plus one dimensions. How many polarizations does it have? Massless gauge field is one polarization. So it's the same as a single scalar. We dualize it. So what do we find on the right hand side? We find the massless boson, massless scalar field, associated with the spontaneous breaking of U1b. So this phi is the Goldstone boson of the spontaneously broken U1b, exactly as in the other side of the duality. Again, the picture is completely different. On the left-hand side, this thing came about because there was a Mexican hat potential and there was spontaneous symmetry breaking and a massless Goldstone boson, et cetera, et cetera. On the right-hand side, we were left with a photon, and the photon was dual to that scalar field. So again, we see that the picture matches between the two sides of the duality. because there's this Goldstone boson. The, normally, when you have a current, 
normally write. Have you seen this equation before? Of ions? No. What's your background? Particle physics or condensed matter or neither? Neither. What's your background? Okay, so a gold. What does it mean that the symmetry is spontaneously broken? I'll give a different answer depending on your background. So what does it mean that the global symmetry, a continuous global symmetry is spontaneously broken? It means that an operator carries the charge as an expectation value. That's what it means. And what that means also is that there is a matrix element, there is a conserved current, d mu, j mu, equal zero. And there is a matrix element in the vacuum and the Goldstone boson. And if we call that phi, that there is this matrix element, so then J mu at low energies look like some constant, which is usually denoted by F times D mu of that phi. So the symmetry is realized in on that current by shifting this curly phi by a constant. And the current is this. So we've already identified this as the current, and the duality tells us that it's spontaneously broken. Another way to say that is that this magnetic monopole gets an expectation value. There are no magnetic monopoles here, and because the symmetry is spontaneously broken. So the physics is, Appears to be, the words appear to be different, but all measurable quantities are exactly the same. Yes? Yes? Uh, yes? Ah, and interesting question. Is there such a conserved current in the spectrum? That current is coupled to a gauge field. And therefore, sorry? Anomaly. No, no anomaly. There's no anomaly. If it had been an anomaly, the theory would have been inconsistent because that's a gauge symmetry. So there's a gauge current. The current couples to a gauge field. And that means <clears throat> that nothing in the spectrum is charged under it. There are no charged objects, there are no charged particles under it. Sorry? Uh, yeah, but it's kind of trivial. Yeah, the equation of motion of A will tell you that it's kind of, of A, B hat will tell you that it's kind of trivial. So there is no such a current. Now, So let me summarize what we have seen in this part. We have exhibited two different scalar field theories, which of them? Okay, I, I claim that whenever there is a symmetry that is spontaneously broken, so imagine there is a U1 and there is some order parameter O, which is carries charge one under the U1, and that O is an expectation value. That's a statement that the U1 is spontaneously broken. Now, if you have a Lagrangian or you have an explicit realization then of the system, then you can do more than that. Very abstractly, I am playing Aldai. I have some operators. I don't know where they came from. I don't care where they came from. They satisfy some correlation function, and it's not even conformal. You have a U1 global symmetry. There's an operator O that carries charge, and it has an expectation value. We know from Goldstone's theorem that there must be a Goldstone theorem, a Goldstone boson. And if you look at the Goldstone, at Goldstone theorem, it goes through the statement that the conserved current, when it acts on the vacuum, must give us a state with a massless state. And it might also give us other things, but there is a non-trivial matrix element to a massless scalar field. And therefore, the current Starts like that, then there are high order corrections. So the current is an operator, the operator current is realized at long distances, this phi is the Goldstone boson, is d mu of phi. And the symmetry acts by shifting phi by a constant. 
if you have a picture with a Mexican hat potential, that symmetry rotates the Mexican hat. And this curly phi is the goldstone, is the mode along the bottom of the trough. And then I simply looked here. So this, look, this is the current. And the current is D of some curly phi. And therefore, that's the goldstone boson of the magnetic symmetry. Okay, so what did we do? We started with two different scalar theories, one with gauge fields and one without. And uh, there are a lot of fine print I have to say here because there's a large space of coupling. So the statement of the duality is that we can tune enough parameters to find a fixed point, which is the same. But generically, the, the transitions between the two sides might be first order, but we can tune it to find the second order point. This was proposed independently by uh, Halprin and Gupta, and earlier by Peskin in a different language. And since then, it was almost proven rigorously, and there's a lot of numerical evidence supporting it, and this duality is just right. So we are going to assume that this is right. These are two different scalar fields, two different theories in the UV, that if we flow to the IR and perhaps fine-tune some coefficients, we find the same fixed point. And the fixed point is what is known as the O2 Wilson Fisher. Fixed point, have you discussed this particular fixed point or not yet? Which is? Ah, so on Friday, you will hear more about this fixed point. For us, for today, we just say it exists. So once it exists, I can start manipulating it. Yes. Yes. Is a flow away with relevant operators? With the R phi square. So as long as I deform the fixed point with relevant operators, this is a meaningful thing to this is a meaningful thing to do. Here is a fixed point, I deform it with relevant operators. What does it do? That's a meaningful question to ask. And the statement is that we get the same answer on the two sides of the duality. It's, it's not even saying that the fixed points are the same is tautological to saying that the deformations by relevant operators are the same. That follows from the fact that the fixed point is the same. That's not true for deformations by irrelevant operators. Because deformations by irrelevant operators are not well defined. And indeed, one of them can take us to one UV theory and the other can take us to the other UV theory. It's not a well defined process. It needs more data. But once we have the fixed point being the same, we can turn on relevant operators and flow out, and it will still be the same. So there's a question of whether they're marginally relevant or marginally irrelevant or exactly marginal. Exactly marginal should be the same. Marginally relevant are like relevant, and marginally irrelevant are not. So what we're going to do now is take this fixed point and manipulate it a little bit. So the section is called Deriving a New Duality. So I'm going to take the two sides of the duality and do the same, the same operation on both. So I'll use this shorthand notation. How much time do I still have? It's completely done or 15 minutes? Ah, oh, plenty, we can solve the universe. Okay, that's, I just, I would just copy that from there. And I included the coupling to the background field. That's very important. We include the coupling to the background field because that keeps track of how the global symmetry is mapped between the two sides. It also allows us to play more games. So let's add to the two sides of the duality
What have I done? I added to the two sides of the duality some terms depending on classical fields. So the two sides are still dual to each other, right? Because I haven't done anything. I added classical terms to the Lagrangian on both sides. And now I'm going to integrate over this B. So since it's the same for, in any, for any background field B, big B, I can integrate over it. How do I integrate using this notation? Uppercase B is a classical field. A dynamical field is denoted by lowercase. All I need to do is replace the big B by little b. So let me do that. And we'll do the same thing here. So now, on the left-hand side, we have a gauged Wilson-Fisher theory. And not only gauge Wilson-Fisher, it's a gauge Wilson-Fisher with k equals 1 turns Simon's term. Is this readable? Because I raised by... So what we have on the left-hand side is the Wilson-Fisher theory coupled to a background field G, B, which we make dynamical, but we also add a level one churn simons term for it. That's what we have on the left-hand side. What do we have on the right-hand side? Well, we have lots of fields. We have pi hat and B hat and lowercase b and the background field A. Yes? Because capital B is a background field, so we have a so we have an equality between theories as a functional of the background field big B. Now I'm going to integrate over it. So it was the same before I, so it was true configuration by configuration they were the same. And therefore if I integrate over it, it on both sides it will also be the same. So let's look at all the terms with B. Have we discussed this theory today? Well, I'll answer yes. This is this U1 level 1, because I can complete the square. Right? Because we have U1 level 1. This B doesn't. So on the left-hand side, B couples to phi. So that's a non-trivial statement. But here, B appears nowhere else. Only here, here, and here. And these terms are linear. So I can reintegrate out little b using the discussion earlier today by completing the square. And... That gives us, so I integrate out B, it gives us D of B hat, phi hat, square, I copy from here, plus phi hat, absolute value to the fourth, copy from here. Then when I complete the square, I'm going to get the square of this, so which is minus pi over four pi B hat, db hat minus i over 2 pi b hat da minus i over 4 pi a d a minus 2 i the gravitational trans simons So we derive the new duality to this theory, which is the Wilson Fisher theory coupled to a gauge field with a U1 churn simons term, is equal to, or is dual, to this theory. So let us first drop all the background fields. So let's ignore this term and this term and that term. So what do we see on the right-hand side? It's again the same Wilson-Fisher theory, coupled to a dynamical field B hat with a churn simons term, but the level is minus one. So if I ignore all the background fields, these theories are almost the same, except that the level of the churn simons term here is plus one, and here it is minus one. You should be shocked by it. You should be shocked by it because this theory is not time reversal invariant. It has this U1 level one. In fact, the theory on the right-hand side 
is its time reversal image. Because it has u1 level minus 1. The statement of the duality is that they are the same. If they are the same, it means that the theory on the left, despite appearance, is time reversal invariant. In fact, it's not quite, the right-hand side is not quite the same as the left-hand side. See, the sign here was flipped, and the sign here was flipped. That's what time reversal would do. But there's also a correction term, an anomaly. So what we learn is that the time reversal image of this theory, db phi square plus phi to the fourth plus i over 4 pi d d b plus i over 2 pi b d a time reversal we just naively flip these two signs but that is the same as the other side up to adding these terms so the time reversal of that is a distinct with the minus sign. You can move these classical terms to the other side, and it will be the same as this using the duality plus this anomalous term. Now we can continue and check this duality the same way we did before. Turn on this phi square, ask what are the allowed operators. I'm over time, I guess, a little bit. Uh, I started a little later. I cannot be both starting a little later and uh, over time. How much time do I have? Five to 10 minutes, great. So one thing we could do is just check this duality, the same way we did before. We should enumerate the operators and map that they check correct, map correctly, check that the global symmetries are the same. We can also deform the theory by turning on various mass terms and check that the deformation does the same thing on both sides. And as we saw before, it will be in a non-trivial way. And finally, we'll relate it to something. So let's start by enumerating the operators. What are the good operators on the left-hand side? Any suggestions? What should we compute? Let me start easy. There is a global U1 symmetry. What is the background field for that U1 symmetry on the left-hand side? A, good. Big A is the, the, the gauge field for it. What is the charge that it couples to? It's what? Star dB. So that's a magnetic charge. So there's a magnetic symmetry on the left-hand side. So what would be the charged object? A monopole operator. So on the left-hand side, we have a monopole operator of B. But because of this term, the monopole operator carries electric charge. What's the electric charge of the monopole? That was a problem I gave you yesterday, and I'm sure all of you worked on it last night. The charge is 1. One way to see that is to find the charge. Now, this is the answer for the problem. The answer to the problem from yesterday you find the charge by differentiating with respect to the gauge field. So if you differentiate with respect to the gauge field B, this would give you dB. And dB integrates to 1 on the, mono, on the monopole. Like more precisely, it integrates to 2 pi, and when you differentiate with respect to B, you get 1 over 4 pi, and a factor of 1 from here and 1 from here makes it 1 over 2 pi, and that integrates to 1. So, the monopole operator is a good thing to study. However, it carries electric charge 1. So it's not gauge invariant. How can we gauge invariant? Is there anything else that carries electric charge? So phi has charge 1 in my convention, so I think I need to put phi dagger. Yeah, phi dagger. Okay, that's a good gauge invariant operator that carries charge 1 under the magnetic symmetry. What is the spin of this object? 
This can be, so it's an operator, it carries spin. There are several ways to compute the spin. One, in U1 level one, we know that this is this Wilson line, which has spin a half, and now we just add a phi to it in order to kill the Wilson line. That gives us spin a half. Another way of thinking about it is that we have this monopole configuration. The monopole by itself is a classical configuration. It has no spin. Phi is a scalar field. But the scalar field of charge one in the background of a monopole carries spin a half. Do you know that? I think this was first discovered by an Indian physicist. Forget his name. It's implicit in Dirac's work anyway. So a scalar field of charge one, or a particle with charge, electric charge one, in the background of a magnetic monopole of charge one, this particle has angular momentum a half. So this phi carries angular momentum a half, with, together with a zero from the monopole. So no matter how you look at it, this object has spin a half. So we are going to define, denote this operator by psi. This is an operator that has charge one, it's gauge invariant, charge one under the global symmetry, and it has spin a half. What does it map to under the duality? Well, we have to repeat the same exercise on the other side. So if you are careful with the signs, you see that what A couples to in terms of B, there was a coefficient plus one. So if we want something with charge one was the monopole, so here we have a minus one, so we should put the MB hat dagger. And we also need to put my convention is phi hat dagger. Because it carries charge minus one because of this. And the claim is that these two operators are dual to each other. Now I can quickly deform the theory by phi square with a positive sign and a negative sign. This has to work because it worked before. And all I did was valid manipulation. But when I do that, with one sign, phi gets a mass, and the system is, phi, phi get, so with one sign here, phi hat, so let me start here, with a positive sign, phi gets a mass, and we are left with, at low energies, with just our trivial theory, semi-trivial theory, and gives us at low energies, this ADA. With the negative sign, phi is Higgs, phi, phi has an expectation value, it Higgs is B, and we can just forget about it and we get zero. So for r equals zero, for r positive, it's gapped. And we have, with a plus sign, so that becomes minus i over four pi, ADA, and let me suppress the gravitational coupling. I integrated out b. For r negative, it's also gapped, And the effective action is zero. What happens on the other side of the duality? R positive translates to negative phi hat square. Same as before. It's the same dictionary as before. That Higgs is phi hat. So it gets rid of it, it get rid of this b hat, and we are left with minus a half minus i over four pi a d a. Let me also copy the gravitational term. With the opposite sign, phi hat gets a positive mass square, so we forget about it. We are left with our friend u1 level one. In this case, it's minus one. We integrate it out, and we end up with zero. So we see that in the two phases, we get the same answers except that positive phi square is mapped to negative phi hat square, and vice versa. So this is a non-trivial check of the duality. So to summarize, we have two bosonic theories that are dual to each other. They are time reversal invariant in a non-trivial way, and that time reversal symmetry is an anomaly. 
and they have operators, fermionic operators, that act, the interesting operators are fermions, and they have a deformation that with one sign of the deformation, we find zero at low energies, and with the other sign, we find this ADA with coefficient one, minus one. Have we seen that before? Have we seen that before? I'll give you a clue, it was in this lecture. The three fermions. So, I'm not going to do it today, make you feel better. This theory is also dual to a free fermion, and that's what I'll do tomorrow. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, I think everybody's tired. Overwhelmed. So try to look for me to ask me questions when I'm around and or tomorrow. And there's one more problem that I haven't yet solved. I gave you yesterday two problems. So one of them I solved today. The other you should do. I'm not going to solve it for you. Okay. Um, let's thank Nadi for the beautiful lecture.